often I find myself in the eye of the storm so much that fear engulfs me and I am unable to discern to discern if my reactions are natural or identity generated. Very good. Please guide me how to be when fear completely takes over. Thank you, uh, Charu. Very good. Again, uh, often I find myself in the eye of the storm. You are the eye of the storm. Eye of the storm means why we speak about uh, eye of the storm. Because wherever there is a storm, there is also a stillness. And the eye of the storm is the stillness that you naturally are. So we are off to a good start, if I can get this uh, point across. So, I often find myself in the eye of the storm, so so much that fear engulfs me. So, when you say in the eye of the storm, we have a different view about what the eye of the storm is. It can be the eye of the storm or the eye of the storm. For me, it will still indicate the same thing. That a storm is going on, it had a beginning, you were there before the beginning. In the duration of the storm, when everything is you're in the midst of your tsunami, oh, okay, you are still very present, as you were before. There is something in you which remains unchanging. At the end of the storm, you are still there. Storm has passed. You are still here. There is an I sense within you, which is serene and still before the storm, during the storm and at the end of the storm. It is not the usual way in which we identify ourselves, but it is the way that I identify you. Who am I speaking about when I say you? In my eyes, you are consciousness. Consciousness cannot be blown around by storms. The body might get blown around by storm. The mind, the entity within the mind, the sense of the person, will feel blown around by the storm that that entity also supports and believes in. But all of this is taking place in front of a deeper truth, which is the I that is pure awareness or consciousness. That is the goal, this I sense, is the goal that I have been endeavouring to point out to each person who comes, saying, I wish to be free, I wish to know my true Self. Then you need to know that the I that you often speak but in your mind believe is a person, is not a person, but pure consciousness. And my talks uh, over the years is not just left at the word level, but I have continued to guide uh, in order that you have the experience of self-discovery, so it is an experiential proof to you, that yourself, in the highest sense, is pure consciousness, which is unborn and imperishable. This is what my words are pointing to. So again, I'll just read over. So often I find myself in the eye of the storm so much. So when you say in the eye of the storm, you're talking about in the middle of the storm. So I just have a diff- I just have a different um, mm, uh, meaning for that. I find myself in the eye of the storm so much that fear engulfs me, and I am unable to discern if my reactions are natural or identity generated. It is identity generated. The I that you are referring to as yourself is your person, your person, the mask over the consciousness that you really are, and. it has taken time 
for many of you, I call let's say my students, to really grow beyond the the, the usual self-reference as a person into the experiential proof that you are the witness of what you call the state of personhood. And even for those more advanced as they grow into deeper experiential understanding, to see that even the witness of the person also, if it has any sense of an entity in it, is also perceivable at even deeper levels. And by deeper, I don't want you or your mind to start thinking, oh, that's deep, deep, deep. The depth I'm talking about is the depth that comes through experience, comes through wisdom, comes through maturing. You come to understand. It means clarity. You become more and more clear as to your true position, uh, rather than the limited um, position that you uh, accept, for the moment at least, that you are. Okay. So often I find myself in the eye of the storm so much that fear engulfs me. Yes, fear will engulf our self image. The idea you think uh, of as yourself will feel ah, oh, and so, and you feel a crackling. And because you identify with that, you take on the full blast of that experience. But as you continue to listen, that I am not placing you there. Some conditioning has placed your identity there. You are earlier and further back in a place where you are untouched. That you are actually the witness of this play, which is appearing on the screen of consciousness. You are the witness, just like you are watching a movie. You can come to that experience. Like you are watching a movie, and there is a storm going on. And uh, let's say, um, I'm stepping a bit further here. That uh, many years ago, I watched one uh, movie. I think it was called Earthquake, and in those days, it was the first time they were introducing uh, this kind of thing called sense around, where they they did something in the cinema room so that when the when the earthquake was appearing on the screen, the sheet the, the seats would shake. So we had a a little bit of a. Uh, 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 an experience as though to give you a, a bit of reality to it. And uh, when this, it was called sense around, nobody knew what it meant. But uh, when we went there and the, 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 on the screen was showing the, the building shaking, our seats started to kind of give the feeling of movement. And actually some people got up out of their seats and started to look for the, for the, for the entrance. Uh, I was not one of them. I, I sat down and I said, "Whoa, whoa! This is hey, this is, it was quite a an experience for me." But nothing was happening to me. It's only in the mind, the mind. Ah, oh, something. Oh, 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 I better get out. And some people are so identified. There's a stage when we are so identified with our body mind identity that you take the full blast of the of the of the mind's demonstration. The mind field, the mind force, and uh, and then we suffer that, of course. So you're asking um, that when this thing happened, when you are engulfed uh, by fear, and you are unable to discern if your reactions are natural or identity generation generated. So I say it is your identity that is suffering it. Identity meaning the idea you are presently holding. To be yourself. That is what suffers it, and that's what is, is, is created the intensity of that experience. Please guide me how to be when fear completely takes over. I will tell you something. I don't agree with you. Fear does not completely take over anything. The fear is your sense around reaction that happens when you are identified as the person and this is happening to me and what can, what am i going to do am i going to die am i going to do you know and all of that is feelings thoughts imagination um, and identity all playing together in front of the consciousness that at present you're not sufficiently aware of nor have you established your identity as consciousness is much more in the state and the place of personhood Reflect on that. So thank you, Charu. Uh, thank you for that. Good.
Yes. That's what's next. Uh, next one. Om Shri Muji. I was already in a difficult situation before this virus. So I was already in a difficult situation before the virus. I'm trying to stay quiet and centered, but as I don't have work anymore, and I'm also one of those fragile persons, for what concerns health, I'm already a fragile person for what concerns health, I'm going down and down, and I'm afraid to go back to my old panic attacks. Naturally, my nerves are shaking badly, and I'm alone. Please pray for me and help me recognize myself. Thank you so much. Rosella from Rome. Okay. So Rosella is saying, I'm, I was already in a difficult situation before the virus came. I'm trying to stay quiet and centered. But as I don't have work anymore, does work help you to be quiet and centered? And sometimes what when you say it in this context, it is as though when I have work, I'm more quiet and centered because maybe your mind tells you you have something to do and you're useful and uh, people need you and you'll be more secure because you have a guaranteed income and so on. So under those circumstances and situation, you may feel, as many people do, that you are more secure, and uh, you know it's it's okay. We're not perfect, but we are not at the bottom of the barrel. So I'm trying to stay quiet and centered, but as I don't have work anymore, and I'm also one of those fragile persons for who who is concerned about health. I find myself going down and down, and I am afraid to go back to my old panic attacks. So what have we got here? Um, uh, I am also one of those fragile persons. There are many people. What makes you fragile? Is it your physical structure? Is it because you are sickly in the body? Is it because you are uh, afraid of life or difficulties that puts you down very quickly? Um, is it for is it a health concern? I'm going down and down, and I'm afraid to go back to my old panic attacks. Uh, many people experience panic attacks. You don't have to be um, sick to feel a panic attack. It could just be an onrush of a lot of things coming, and the mind is not stable enough to see them in the correct light, and so they build up, and we feel like we are like some pressure cooker building up, and then somehow it is as though we can't take it, and some kind of collapsing goes, we just collapse into some nervous mess or something like that, and nobody enjoys that. That's not good. But I'm backing up a little bit. I don't have work anymore, and I'm also one of those fragile persons. Well, fragile does not mean that you are a sort of a slim, very skinny being who you know is not a muscle man, no. Because if you look at someone like uh, Sri Mahatma Gandhi, he was a very skinny chap, you know, and he uh, was, but in his spirit. He was mighty. He was a mighty being, actually. So fragile does not mean that you don't have, you know, physical strength. Actually, you know, God shows in many cases that people who you think are a little soft and you can step over them are great beings within their own spirit and in their being. So what are you referring to as your fragile person? And normally, I'm sensing. Uh, uh, you say you have concerns for health, so I don't know if you have a health issue or something, health problem. You can have a, a health, an unhealthy body to some degree. Many people do. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you're worried about it. Some people are been sick and they're physically not well, but they are actually quite happy in their being. It is possible, no? Um, and uh, so I just that caught me. What makes you a fragile person? I would say what often makes people a fragile person. The strongest case is when you are not established in your true nature. That is the most um, uh, common um, uh, reason, I would say, for this sense of fragility, even more so than a sickly body. Sometimes we are fragile because we are living too much in our minds, and then you become to see that your mind actually sometimes is not your best friend. It's not your friend, and not yet. Only when you have come to a greater understanding of your true nature, and then the mind, seeing that he cannot conquer you, he will join you and also come back to its own source. So, um, as I don't have work anymore, and I'm also one of those fragile persons. Take your pick if you want to describe yourself as a fragile person. A fragile person, for me, is like a fragile state than a, than a fragile being. A fragile state of mind, meaning that the mind that is not living inside the heart, at some point, uh, some people may think that they are very strong, but some small thing can knock them over. So that delicacy, that delicateness, rather, rather than delicacy, delicateness often comes with not being centered in your own heart. And let me have my own word in saying that I feel that a human life comes alive when you are discovering your true nature. Not when you are making riches and having all the material things in the world. That's not going to help you on on this day. You know, it's no use if you are a millionaire, you know, in the desert when there's nothing there. You what's not what is not going to help you that you have a beautiful house in in California or someplace. You have to be rich inside your heart. Now, and you are actually. This is why I can speak to you like this, because I am endeavouring to remind you that as you come more deeply into your real discovery of yourself, you are going to find great strength, unbelievable strength, in fact. That is possible for you. Now you say, my nerves are shaking badly, and I am alone. Well, it all goes together. If you are not centred in your own self, which you can be, and that, oh, that's what I am here for, sitting here, to remind you of that. If you are not centred inside your own heart, and then on top of that, you say, I'm feeling alone. Again, aloneness is not a negative state. Aloneness, sometimes you need, everyone needs to be alone. And you need also to be good at being alone. Okay? Aloneness is not a curse. There are some people who are dying to be alone, they are, they are aching to be alone because their life is too full of the noise of other people. So don't curse yourself by accepting these things as though that's bad for you. It's your mind is saying, Oh, you're look at you're alone also. And you are buying that because you are not um paying attention to your real self, then you become very vulnerable to the minds like the the negative side of the mind is taking advantage of you, so to speak. But it's a relationship, okay? You are still there. You have power. Um, so please pray for me and help me recognize myself. This is what is happening right now with this letter reading this letter to you. There's every hope for you. There's every chance for you to wake up to the richness you already are. So please be lifted up by this. I'm with you. I'm on your side. God bless you, um, Rosella. Thank you. I'm going to have a little sip of my tea. Very nice. This is a uh, Tulsi tea. <laughs> I didn't used to. Uh, uh, I am enjoying it at the moment with some. Um, with 
anyway not sugar some stevia very nice thank you let's move on let's see what's next now mm -hmm. ah to live is to give okay who is this barika never heard this name before barika is saying to live is to give everything that exists really exists in harmony when it is embraced with love how to embrace a coronavirus with love with infinite love and light uh, barika okay let's uh, let's take this one on to live is to give to live is to give for many people to live is to receive i think we are more receiving than we are giving actually you receive everything from mother earth you receive everything from god you you are constantly receiving but we are thinking well maybe we just take it for granted that we are entitled to receive here in my heart and amongst our Sangha, I have introduced a very unusual idea, which is that live as though you have no rights, you have no entitlements. Now, if you're not used to this, what it really means, you might think, what? I'm not giving up my rights. But here we have come to understand the deeper meaning and implication of that. It means when you give up the, the, the expectations, of having rights, then you really begin to see much, much more how much gratitude comes into your heart, and that you don't just expect that because you're alive, you're entitled to things. You come to be grateful for what you have and be very open, and somehow some kindness, humility comes out of that. So you say, to live is to give then everything that exists really exists in harmony when it is embraced with love everything that exists really exists in harmony when it is embraced with love well with love and wisdom i don't know what is your concept of love it's a very broad word used by almost every single human being, love. And we seem to have different, um, I would say, um, meanings we give to what love means. And we within ourselves also keep changing what the meaning is. Love has been one of the most broadly used terms. There's personal love. The love I have for the people that I care about, the people who are my family, uh, can be. Not everyone have love for their family, by the way. So we cannot take it for granted. Love sometimes is apportioned from us, meaning that we, we almost choose who we want to love. Love is so universal that you could love the whole world and lose nothing, in fact. We are quite stingy with our love. We feel that some people are worth loving and others not. We can look a bit more into that. So everything that exists really exists in harmony when it is embraced with love. I would add, and wisdom, when you see that. There is a harmony in the world anyway. If there is disharmony, I would say that it's more like like some opposites, but not opposition. The opposites which are necessary to produce and generate the necessary friction for growth to take place. So not opposition, which I mean more something to do with the mind. It's not trying to get rid of one another. Um, so um, how to embrace a coronavirus with love? Well. I don't know if anybody will um, be willing to, or open enough to say, I am embracing coronavirus with love. 
coronavirus is not a person, it's not personal. It's not that if you love coronavirus, it's going to be more kind to you. Um, what you would mean is that uh, the nearest I come, I can come to uh, really mm, be with your statement like that or your question, how to embrace a coronavirus with love. I would say that uh, every or any true spiritual minded person uh, will find goodness in every challenging situation. You may have heard me say, the wise person builds a house with the stones that his enemy throw at him, okay, and lives happily in this house. What it means? Uh, it means that out of hardship, out of uh, challenges, uh, a wise uh, person not just complain about the stone and you know I hate these stones, but something whether they see it clearly enough in the moment, or whether it just creates, uh, transmits some change inside them. They often grow from difficult situation. They would not choose to be in difficulty, but when it does come, they are more reflective. They they see with wider eyes, and with deeper wisdom, and get more out of more goodness in some sometimes, even greater goodness than they than they would in happier times. You see, so this is just a part of life. So I wouldn't say how to embrace coronavirus with love. I would say more to look at what it really brings us, because many people would just like to get rid of it. That's how we are when we are children. You know, if some ants bite you, you go and step on their nest and kill as many as you can. That is that that is a reaction that comes when we are hurt. You want to destroy the thing that hurts you. But uh, you know, in the same way that we often regard sickness as a kind of curse, but very often sickness can be a kind of healing also. That when we are being restored and we are detoxing, that feels like a kind of sickness also, but something is being cleansed. So I would like to just to, um, to say to you, Barika, um, that uh, it's not the, you know, a question of embracing coronavirus, but learning from it. And many people around the world are, are being transformed. They are being changed. Um, I hope for the good, because you can change for the good, that this time that we are by ourselves, some people in the beginning, if we look back a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, that you have been through three weeks of having to be by yourself. And it may have come sometimes when it's enormously difficult. We are so stressed by it. We're on top of that. We are worried if we're going to get this thing. And some people have lost relatives. And it's been very chaotic all over the world. But I am also telling you that this is a time of change. And it's a change that we may not feel that we have the strength to keep up with, but I'm telling you that you do. And very often, uh, we in our modern times, and in certain parts of the world, we are not used to this kind of hardship. There are many peoples of the world who are used to this kind and greater kinds of hardship. And they have had to grow and in, in ways that I don't need to name, but they become more resilient, they become more helpful and sharing with each other. They've been through catastrophes and calamities. And we are going through one of these things now, and it will pass. But at the same time, while it is here, make the best use of it. And our my, I would say, as well as I'm sure there are many people around the world who are encouraging our world family to not panic and to use this time. Myself, I have put out some guidances, some um, simple meditations that anybody can follow. And why? To help you to really get back in touch with the one place you need to be in touch with. 
we are forced to stay at home, in our physical home. I want you to choose to discover your inner home, the home of being and of your true nature. And this is why I am here sharing with you. I have some uh, uh, videos. Uh, one is called um, uh, excerpt like Find the Peace and Space Within You. Look it up, please, and, and, and listen to them. These will help you to begin to discover uh, your inner being. And I would say this is one of the ways in which you can turn around what may seem to be a catastrophe into a blessing, when it gives you opportunity to discover your true nature. You know, um, uh, Barika, thank you. You know, uh, there are many people who are spending this time catching up with things that they have longed to do, time that they really needed to spend just to slow down, because their their life is moving faster than a pace that they can keep up. There are many people who are stressed by their work conditions. There are many people who needed to spend more time with their children or with their families. There are many people who needed just to be alone. It's not just it's just a catastrophe for everyone. I would say that it is an opportunity for everyone. Please uh, take it. Many beings, like myself and others, are in service to you in this moment to try and direct us all to find a higher place within ourselves. The world is changing in a new way. We don't know how that change will be. That's not a reason to be depressed. I feel and hope and pray and believe it will be bring about some mighty good changes for everyone. I am not against anyone. I am feeling that this change, difficult as it may appear to you and be experienced in you at the moment, has a lot of spiritual vitamins, vitamins, a lot of uh, wonderful things to come. But as it has been throughout our histories, that sometimes we go through difficulties to be reborn in a new way, to reach higher ways of being. Please. Uh, keep your heart open to this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see now. Uh, this letter comes from Maria. Namaste, Muji. I am writing from Italy and exactly from Bres- Bresca or Brescia. Bres- Brescia. B R E S C I A. Okay, that's the spelling. The area with the highest density of infected people. In this time, my mind is so noisy, but I want to take advantage of quarantine to know better my true nature. Look at that. This is a big opportunity for me. Please show me the way. Pray for us. Bless us. I pray for you. My will, my wish and will and intention and prayer is that uh, you will all grow strong out of this uh, out of this time. Sometimes the greatest strength comes on the flip side of our weakest moment. Okay? Here, Maria is saying that she's living in an area, Brescia or Brescia, the area with the highest density of infected people in our country. In this time, my mind is so noisy. Yes, you see. Is mind speaking the truth? Is mind reacting truthfully? No. No. And one thing I want to say to you don't trust your mind so quickly. Trust God. You may not know what God is. I will talk about this more one time. But we have an instinctual, uh, deep 
urge within us to find the truth and to find our highest self. That is the God self. Okay? God self and your deepest truth of yourself are one and the same. I am not speaking necessarily religion to you. Okay? I am speaking truth. Okay? So, um, in spite of living, you know, oh, okay, you are living in the most inf densely infected area. In this time, my mind is so noisy. Of course, the mind is, it's you know, it comes up with fears, and you're gonna die, and what's gonna happen to you, and the world is this, and so on. And in times like this, you see, you get a chance to see the behavior of the ego mind or the psychological aspect of the mind, you see it is not in service to your true nature. Okay? We are seeing this. And because we are for so long out of habit and culture created such an intensely intimate relationship with our mind to the extent that we believe we are our mind largely, when he's making trouble like this, we suffer. We suffer. I want to show you a way out of it, you see. But I want to take advantage, she says, Maria. I want to take advantage of quarantine to know better my true nature. Now, this for me, this letter touches my heart immediately. This woman is expressing a very high aspiration. I want to use the restrictions, the seeming limitations imposed upon my my daily life. I want to use this moment when I can't go out, I've got to be by myself. I want to use this to discover my true nature. This is a big opportunity for me. She sees it as an opportunity for me. Please show me the way. Uh, pray for us, bless us. Blessed are you. Blessed be you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Om Namah Shivaya. Love, Maria. Please show me the way. Maria, I would like you and others like yourself who are feeling, I don't just want comforting words, they are helpful. I don't want to hear any more so much about coronavirus, coronavirus, reading, reading, listening, 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 because it is often building into the fear image. The news has to do their work. But to sit there listening to the news, telling you how many more people have died and how much is spreading, is not helpful to you. What you must do now is withdraw and pull in your attention, don't become a recluse, not running away from the world, but more turning towards yourself. Okay? Maria has shown beautifully the attitude that is necessary. So for others like Maria, I have put uh, some uh, videos which are guidances and guided meditations. Because I say guided meditations. Because many people don't even know what a meditation is. Some people just think you just close your eyes and imagine something. But meditation is for actually leaving behind all the usual noise of the mind. Sometimes when we try to do that, it seems as though the mind gets even louder. Okay? Don't worry about that. That's a natural, normal reaction. But don't give up. One simple way that I can show you in a few moments is to, if I say to you, even if your mind feels like, if you ask him, mind go away, he's not going away, you say what to do. Well, if you pay attention only to that sense within you, when you are not engaged with the mind, so mind could be knocking at your door, okay? He has the freedom to knock, but you don't have to let him in. Okay? So he's knocking at the door, meaning that's bringing up all these kind of things and all these kind of worries and so on. But there is space for you. There's always space for you when you concentrate only upon yourself without 
your form, without your image, just your natural sense of self. Just like when you close your eyes, you are not looking at your body, you have a sense of being. This simple sense of being, I would say, don't allow it to connect up with any thought flow, or thinking about the future, or worrying, even though those feelings and energies might be floating around, let them float around. Learn to to be in your inner quarantine, meaning whatever is going on, you are not allowed to get in touch with them. To get in, now that may feel very difficult in the beginning, okay, but you persevere. You just stay in this sense of being, because what tends to happen many times we naturally come to this state of being because it is natural to us. But as soon as you come there, a thought comes, or something to do, or something, or we feel bored, or the mind says you are bored, and then you start to look for something to do. This is a bad habit that we have all cultivated at some point. Okay, but now I'm saying be aware of that, and just remain quiet. Be aware that the mind is coming like this, but don't give it, don't feed it. And even if it's like a baby that is crying and pulling at your dress, this is the one baby you can ignore for now. Okay? And just keep to that. It's as though you are empty. Take everything out. It doesn't matter when you take things out, even if they're right by your ears, they're still out. You take them out, meaning that you're not engaging with them. If everything could be taken out, if everything to do with thoughts and feelings and memory and desire and uh, you know sensations were taken out there would remain something here that cannot be taken out that is your natural state it's just a state of being not being a woman or being a man or being chinese or being indian no, just of being it has no color it has no shape as you listen to my words, you see, sometimes the mind comes, yeah, but this is too difficult, that's not helping, and so on. Be aware, because you know the mind's grumbling habit very well. And over these period of time that we are we are challenged by, so so to speak, by this virus, mind has been really giving you a hard time. But the mind is not you. You can exist without this troublesome mind. But it cannot exist without you. Okay? You are first. In fact, you are before first. Okay? You must at least begin to be open to discover this, because this is your way to truth and everlasting life. Everlasting life meaning that there is within you, the real truth of you cannot die. It cannot get coronavirus or any other thing. It is pure. The body. Coronavirus is for the body. It's also for the mind, because the mind is panicking, but not for your spirit. And spirituality means to discover your spirit self. Spirit does not mean ghost. Spirit means your true nature, which is the source of peace, of love, of serenity of joy, of wisdom, of life itself. Okay, I am saying this to you, I am looking at you, and I am telling you this, that that is true. Okay, So, as you spend time, it could be... it could be... 10 minutes, 7 to 10 minutes, put some, some attention just on sitting like this, and being empty. And at first, some people may say, it doesn't work for me, I can't do that. My mind is just my mind is even worse. Yes, no, it's gonna get worse before it gets better in some cases. But you will continue maturing and growing and growing and growing. Don't give up. Don't give up. If you can only do it five minutes, do that five minutes. And I will tell you that at a certain point, when you persist and insist on finding the truth, you will start to experience 
not the mind running about, but the space in which the mind is perceived. Even if you have a little taste, you are going to want more. And more of what? More of you, more of your true self and nature. Okay? So start with this, watch the videos that I recommend and the guidances that I recommend, which is like I think I gave one before that says, Find the peace and space within you. That is like a 30 minute uh, uh, video. And there's an audio, I think it's called An Introduction to Your True Self. I think that's what it's called. I hope I'm not wrong, but uh, look it up and listen to that one or so. But there are others, there are others. And I would like to tell you that there are also other teachers who are maybe putting some words online and so on to guide people throughout this time. Okay? Whatever resonates with you, and you feel that it is really bringing you home or to a place, home and stillness and peace are the same thing. The home here is greater than the home here, and you are going to discover that. God bless you. All the very best to you. All love to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Maria. Little sip again. Okay, let's see who is coming up now. Dear Smuji, in these challenging, I have a picture with two people here. A letter from Henrietta. In these challenging times, I am asking your blessings for the elderly people of the world. I can start right there. All the elderly people throughout the world who are said to be more vulnerable at this time, I pray that you will transcend the fear about these things. It is not necessary, or nor is it um, uh, necessarily true that you know um, coronavirus is out to get you. There are many elderly people who may even have some uh, ailments and so on who will not be affected by coronavirus, just as there are some young people who have strong immune systems, strong bodies, who are also catching uh, uh, coronavirus. But uh, I don't want by saying this to create panic about it. Okay? Because you have to remember also that throughout our lives, there are many, many sicknesses in life, you know, many kind of flus, many sicknesses that we don't talk about, that don't appear on the news. Why? Because that is the way of life. There are thousands of people uh, dying from lots of things every day. I feel that what is uh, particularly catching our attention is that uh, the coronavirus is a worldwide uh, phenomenon at the moment. I see even good things in this. It's one of the ways in which we have to acknowledge and see that we are one race. We are one uh, as people. Coronavirus is not here to attack West Indians, or Chinese, or white people, or whatever. It's not those things make no difference to to this. So because of this, uh, we are compelled also to recognize that we are one. We are fighting this together, and we are seeing that around the world efforts are being made by very very diverse uh, peoples, nations that are sometimes in conflict with each other are supporting each other throughout this crisis. Okay. This is a good thing, and I would love you to be aware of that. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things happening at, at the moment also, that a lot of people are in service to helping mankind. Remember one time I told you that somebody asked Papaji, my own spiritual master, 
They said, Papaji, you know, what must mankind do to really elevate the human species? And Papaji says, mankind must become kind man. Mankind must become kind man. And now we are seeing the kind man emerging out of us, where we are having to help one another throughout this time. And no blame, no shame, just help and love. And so many people, I have to say, I applaud along with millions of people, the efforts that are being made in the, through the medical world, through the, through the aviation world, through the shipping world, through many, through the armies who are now employed, uh, em, employed to, to help in ways that are not their traditional way, also some of them. And I, it's, it really is also producing the best of human nature also. Don't you agree? So I did not finish this letter, no? So in the letter from Henrietta, in these challenging times, I am asking your blessing for the elderly people of, in the world. Many are now alone at home or alone in nursing homes without the care and love of their family. This is very difficult. It is very difficult. It's a, it's difficult for the elderly. It's difficult for the families. And my heart really goes out to you. Um, but to say, please do not focus on this right now. Um, I pray and include the families in the prayers that they will be comforted uh, by the work also that's happening. Calamities are like that. We cannot pick and choose. Uh, it it is it is so painful to see what is happening throughout the world, but we are doing everything we can. Each one, myself included, and our community is doing whatever we can, in our own way, small way, to alleviate some of the collective stress and fear, and uh, really applying. Uh, the, the correct, not just attitude, but the, the services that are needed for those who most need them. God be with you. God is with you. Some of them even pass over without loved ones around them. This is understandable. But you know, there are so many caregivers. There are so many people who I know, some of them personally, okay, who are in the role of being with people who are severely ill, and they are the surrogate family when your family cannot be there for you. There are times in life when our lives and we are in deep predicament, far away from our loved ones and it can feel a very painful time. Uh, but God is with you, and it does not matter, even if someone has to leave their body in the desert, where nobody uh, knows that they are there. I want to tell you something. An angel of God will come for you. Or some of your relatives who have gone before you, you will come to see them. The death is more great in the minds of the living than those who are transcending. Okay? There is a certain point where we are very terrified, and especially for many people who feel that they have lived a life without love and without care enough, you know, that uh, they may feel something comes. It's like you 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 come to a moment when you feel, I wish I had done that. Your life is not over. Even in those days, you can make a prayer, Lord, please help me, forgive me um, for the, the, the things I could have done better, and whatever it is. It is, a, it is really a most intimate time, and a time when I will say to you that it is your time with God. There is a time when it has got to be just you and God. Okay? There are beings in the world who have evolved spiritually so highly, 
that even at times like this, they don't need to pray. Okay? But for all of us, we need to pray and to, to ask for forgiveness or to ask for mercy or ask to be absorbed or to merge into the kingdom of God or whatever. Whatever your religion, I don't mind, whatever your your gurus and prophets or sages and saints, you will call upon them. It, it is the way of things. Okay? But they are on earth also, many caregivers, many people whose time has been used to spend with people who are leaving their bodies and to care for them. I would like to reassure uh, the, the the families that not in every case it is that your family just die without anyone loving them. Even the doctors who are working in the most severe cases, their, their being with your family is an expression of love. Please don't forget, love is very broad and it is still the hand of God working with them. The nurses are working with them. Everyone, everyone is 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 sharing this. So I know the pain of this moment and I am I am with you in this. Okay? Thank you so much for also blessing my mother uh, Margaret uh, Margaret with your grace. She has dementia and I cannot visit her right now. With gratitude and much love to you, your team, and and to all of us, may the light set us all free, Henriette. Thank you, Henriette. God bless you all, all who are in the very um, in the very heart of this storm, in the very height of this storm. Um, bless you. Uh, I cannot tell you how much the presence of God, how much truth, how much you cannot you cannot be without the guidance and the presence of pure consciousness. I have to tell you that. Sometimes we suffer more on behalf of those we care for or are worried about, sometimes we suffer more on their behalf than they suffer within themselves. Again, sometimes in our worry and our feeling we are so apart from our families and so you know this type of thing, or for someone that you are worried about, sometimes we suffer more on their behalf than they are suffering themselves. Bear that in mind, and God bless you. Thank you. My beloved Guruji, I relocated with my teenage daughter from Argentina to the Netherlands three weeks ago, when the coronavirus or the coronavirus crisis exploded and a few days before my country closed its borders. We are at my partner's house, also from Sangha, adjusting to spending 24-7 together in the same space for the very first time. I am sure many of you can relate. I know some are separated from their loved ones, so I am very grateful. I know God makes no mistakes. That is a tremendous knowing. That is a tremendous wisdom and faith. Again, I know God makes no mistakes. Still, Guruji, we struggle sometimes. Moving in harmony and personal stuff is triggered. Yes, 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 yes. I know. I know. Sometimes uh, this is going to be the greatest test and the greatest challenge put upon our relationships of varying kind, whether it is with your family, with your partner, with your children, with yourself even. 
what a great move God is moved on us to put you in quarantine with your family and with yourself and with life. So these things are going to come. Don't treat or regard your challenges, okay, as curses. See them that they come actually out of love. Haha, <laughs> very challenging thing for me to say. Why love? Because it compels you to grow beyond your present perception of your limitations. Okay? So we struggle sometimes moving in harmony and personal stuff is triggered. You think you are supposed to live and keep your personal stuff all nice and tidy? Your personal stuff and your person is not you. Not you in the absolute sense. Our person is the mask worn over our true self. Our person is our conditioned identity, based upon the belief that we are our body form. And that gives it is also an expression or mode of consciousness, but it is not the fullness of consciousness. It is a very limited uh, mode of consciousness. So when times like this come, it shows you where you're tight in your person. You can, you know, you, there's no room to really expand, and so in a sense, there is room to expand. You see, when there is no way, and you have faith in God, as you have said, God makes no mistakes. When there is no way, God shows you a way. When there is no way. Consciousness, pure consciousness, the Lord Supreme will find a way for you, especially those of you who trust and hold to the truth, will show you the way. So all is not lost, and there is much to gain. Okay? I continue. The lockdown has brought new pressures and challenges to everyday family life for many around the world. Yes, it has and will do. But I want to tell you something. Again, I keep stressing over and over again. Don't perceive hardships as a curse. Yes, we don't enjoy. But very often, things we don't enjoy are the things also that help you to grow. Sometimes we have inherited or developed, consciously or unconsciously, weaknesses within our being that we are not readily in touch with, and that they are holding your being hostage, and we are not aware of them. And in times of trouble, in times of testing, in times of distress, we have to face up, and they help to flush out these deeper fears, they bring it to the surface. And things that come to the surface, come to the surface to be put out. So when the phlegm comes to your throat, don't swallow again, spit him out. I know these examples seem very crude, but it gets to my point I want to try and make to you. If you can um, imagine an earthquake at the bottom of the ocean, Lots of bubbles are set free, trapped, and they come to the surface. When they touch the surface, they they pop and they disappear. Something like this has to happen to all of us. Every human being has somehow collected or absorbed many poisonous things in our bodies and our minds throughout our life. And it is a great thing when it's time to detox. And we're probably not aware that you are being helped to be to, to be detoxed. And the detoxing sometimes is not pleasurable. Just like if you have experienced vomiting when you're feeling some disturbance in the stomach and you want to vomit, how horrible it feels. How horrible it feels. 
that you're going to vomit, you don't know when, you don't know how. Sometimes you're in a very inconvenient place. You have to vomit, you have to vomit. It's the most horrible feeling. But when it's over, it's the greatest relief. And sometimes we have to vomit up our sickness, sickness of thought, sickness of body, sickness of being, sickness of of ego has to be burped up out of our lives. And it comes up in many unexpected ways like this. But my dears, don't be discouraged. You have written something very powerfully. On this page so far, what is glaring out at me is your statement, I know God makes no mistakes. It is like highlighted on this page, this letter you've written to me, Paz. Okay. So I am encouraged to share what I'm sharing with you. So again, you say the lockdown has brought new pressures and challenges to everyday family life from many around the world. Can you please offer some advice to make us of this time or opportunity to grow in love and openness? Thank you. You are in my heart always. Paz. And I saw a lovely picture of the two of them smiling. Well, I'm sure they're not always smiling. Okay? But that's life. Uh, in sometimes when you live together and you see your edges are rubbing together, some things like this, you also must keep in mind that we are growing from this. We are deepening also. Sometimes why not deepen in love? Maybe sometimes we're living and we just enjoy our, each other in a superficial way, and now you know you you know everywhere you cannot get away from each other, and it's your mind mostly. You know, I tell you who is suffering this coronavirus: your mind. Coronavirus is suffering. Your mind is suffering it. Your identity is suffering it. Your ego is suffering it more. You see, but it's come for everybody. So take courage, and um, you know, or be of good faith and courage. I wish you all the very best. I hope what I've shared with you in this letter is uh, encouraging and uplifting, and increasing in love and patience and tolerance and gratitude. Also, gratitude is as great as any medica- any medication. Gratitude and positivity and faith are also great medicines not only for and against a coronavirus but against all the other the virus of fear of stress of impatience of anger and frustration okay i made recently one video of thank you go to that video watch it and alongside myself Say thank you, thank you to existence, thank you, thank you for life, thank you that I have a mind that I can think and contemplate, thank you for the challenges that have been brought to me now that you have shown me I can overcome them, thank you for uh, friends or for those who love me, thank you for this difficult moment that we are facing so that we are compelled to go more deeply. Thank you that we can uh, have this time also to look into ourselves, that we have to be more creative, we have to refresh our spirit. We thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord of the Universe, thank you, consciousness, thank you, existence, like that. Okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just going to read one more letter for now, for today. For this moment, um, and it goes like this My dear Father Muji Baba, I am not afraid. Hmm. Let's carry on. I am not afraid. I know that my thoughts, sentiments, and feelings are only the ephemeral colors of pure consciousness, of the profound silence from which everything comes. Whoa. Oh, that is strong, and that is beautiful, and that is light. I'll continue. I am conscious of everything, 
But in this difficult time, my 21-year-old son is trapped in Colombia because all borders are closed. This is Mother speaking. We hope for his repatriation soon. But as I am in my heart, peaceful and serene, suddenly tears come, and I am flooded by a great sadness. I cry. I cried so much since I met you. Why does this body cry so much? Is the love of a mother for her child also part of the ego? Hmm. Is it maternal instinct? Is it God crying for the ego? I know that pure consciousness does not cry. So I already have my answer. Because thanks to your satsangs, I become aware that I am crying and I go back quickly to my heart, the place of my retreat. Is it normal to stay in this silence without even feeling the need of praying? As if the silence itself was my prayer. I say thanks to life every day. Thank you for everything, my Father. Thank you for your prayers. With my deepest gratitude, I love you, Barbara. And this letter is translated from French. Wow. 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 <laughs> Whoa! I'm going to read it again. My dear father, Muji Baba, I am not afraid. I know that my thoughts, sentiments, and feelings are only the ephemeral colors of pure consciousness, of the profound silence from which everything comes. I am conscious of everything. But in this difficult time, my 21-year-old son is trapped in Colombia because all borders are closed. We hope for his repatriation soon. But as I am in my heart, peaceful and serene, suddenly tears come and I am flooded by a great sadness. I cry. I cried so much since I met you. It is very natural thing. Your child, old as he is, he's an adult, but to a mum, still my child, still my baby, is in another country where the borders are closed, we are hoping that there is a repatriation soon. There are flights happening in different parts of the world to take home the last remaining foreigners in countries, to take them home. We pray that he is one of them amongst the others who are taking returning home. But as I am in my heart, peaceful and serene, suddenly tears come, and I am flooded by a great sadness. Totally understandable. A great wave of sadness uh, floods my being. Yes. I cry. I cried so much since I met you. Sometimes we cry, For no particular reason. In the same way that sometimes we find ourselves laughing for no particular reason. When you have uh, you are moving more deeply into your self-discovery, your emotions don't follow the usual 
um, what you may call customs of uh, life. You may find yourself laughing, laughing, laughing also. And but there's no joke. And then next minute, switch, crying, 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 crying. But sometimes even no sadness. But you speak of a great sadness, a flood of great sadness. Yes, whatever it is, it comes, it arises in the being. After all, you are a mum, and also they may come like this. Sometimes they, you are aware. What uh, Barbara is showing is that she is still aware of the sadness, the joys, the sorrows, the reliefs, the pain, the suffering, the peace, all of these things, as they arise, as they come, they are coming and going, sometimes like clouds floating by the infinite, in the infinite expanse of the sky. She, her being, she finds like the sky. Why does this body cry so much? she asked. She didn't say, Why am I crying so much? She's finding that as she discovers more and more a deeper truth, crying happens. And sometimes it's not the first time I've heard people say, oh, Baba, I find myself crying, crying, all the time, crying, crying. You know, what's wrong with me? I said, Is there anything wrong with you? They said, No. It's like I don't think anything is wrong, but I just get up and I'm crying, crying. I said, Listen, you cannot explain the ways of the children of God. You cannot. They cannot explain. Sometimes they find themselves laughing, laughing, crying, crying, crying. It's good if you have your own apartment. And if you're alone, haha, <laughs> this can be a great field for expressing the the we are like nature. Sometimes there's great wind, sometimes a hurricane, sometimes a great stillness, sometimes there's a tidal wave. Sometimes there's such a deep, deep serenity. I mean, it's like your being filled you feel as though your entire being is filled with mercury, a peace mercury that is just, ah. Another moment you're like a leaf blowing in the wind. You experience all these things, but you experience them from a state which is unmoving. Those of you who have recognized this know it very well. Others maybe are thinking, Whoa, you know, I don't know if I could handle that and so on. That's how the mind is for a while for now. But it is changing, and by God's grace that change is coming for so many people. Why does this body cry so much? Is the love of a mother for her child also part of the ego? Um, yes. Yes. Please don't be upset at that. I'm not talking to Barbara when I said that, because I think she understands me. It is natural that we cry. It's natural that we grieve. It's natural and normal, considering the conditioning we, uh, we take to be ourselves. I am here to show you also deeper levels of your being, whereby you know you are much more detached. But don't think that this detachment is like you don't care. No, it's like you do care. It's not that you don't care, but more that you don't mind. You have come to a more accepting um, way within your own heart where you know that things which are outside of your control are just the way that they are, and you accept that. What's the point of fighting about it? And you have found peace with that also. So this is very, very important. OK? Um, now you continue. Uh, so you ask, Is the love of a mother for her child also part of the ego? Yes, it is. It's not a dreadful thing, but gradually you come to you come to a certain stage when you realize that all of this life is you actually, all of this life, everything is just appearing in the consciousness that you are. For some people, that might be a bit much to take in right now, but don't give up and don't be despaired by this. This is a tremendous discovery. Okay. 
Is it maternal instinct, meaning is it just comes with motherhood? Is it an, an instinct of motherhood? Yes, it is an instinct also. It is also an instinct of motherhood. Although it is not a fact of motherhood. If it is a fact, then it means that every mother would feel like that. Not every mother feel like that. Uh, men, some mothers are very, very accepting. Some are much, much more maternal. It's like they own their baby. And many people, of course, they feel that their children belong to them. I said, that is, uh, well, that's fine. Okay, that's okay. Um, you know. Actually, I remember one time many years in the market, and I was selling incense in the market, and I saw a woman was with her child. The child was must have been about four years old, four or five years old, and she was kind of like dragging him through the market a bit, you know. And he started to cry. She told him, "Sit there." She was very, very harsh with him, you know. You sit there. Don't you move. And every time she turned around to go and look at whatever she was looking at, the child stood up, and she slapped him very hard. I really couldn't take it, you know. I just jumped in and I said, "You don't you do that. Don't you do that." She looked at me and she said, "Who are you? Who are you?" She said, "You know, this is my child. This is my child." I said, "No, it's not your child. It's God's child." It's God's child. You are making a big mistake. This is not your child. He is in your charge. It's not your child. It is God's child. And I'm standing here, and if you do that again, you're going to see what's going to happen. And actually, more people came around, and they, they stood around her. And I said, Listen, you know, you can do what you want, but you're not going to hit this child again. And I'm going to tell you like this we had to call. The police actually came there. And in the end, she apologized. She apologized, and actually she walked off. And when she turned around to look at me, she looked at me like this for a moment, and then she said, uh, like this with her head. I don't, know, I don't know what that meant, but I took it that she acknowledged that she had uh, stepped beyond uh, what was right. You know? So I just say this. You say, is it maternal instinct? I, I mean, for me, in that moment, in that situation, it's not my child. It was my maternal instinct to go and protect this child. So it's instinct in us to love. When we have lost her away, when we are really not established in our heart, then we may do things like that through bad upbringing and negative conditioning or whatever like that. Okay? So and then you ask, is it God crying or the ego crying? Is it God crying or the ego crying? Well, you know, I want to say to you, Barbara, is it God crying? If I were to say yes to you, that is a very, very, very high statement I'm making. It is the God crying if you know that God is everything. But I'm going to answer today. It is the ego crying. Mostly, it's the ego crying. In the highest, in the highest sense, I could say it is the God self. It is the consciousness. It is consciousness that is crying. It is consciousness that is laughing. It is consciousness that is separated, experiencing all these things and yet beyond them. Okay. Sorry, I have to leave you to deal with that. Now I continue. I know that pure consciousness doesn't cry. Here she goes now. You see, I should have read that bit. Okay, I know that pure consciousness does not cry, so I already have my answer. Thank you, thank you. But I am answering in a very universal way also, because thanks to your satsangs, I become aware that I am crying, and I am, and I go back quickly to my heart, the place of my retreat. I go quickly back to my heart, the place of my retreat. My retreat is actually my home, in the highest sense. Okay. Is it normal to stay in this silence without even feeling the need for praying? As if the silence itself was my prayer. There is some deep wisdom in you that will inform you in the moment that this silence 
is synonymous with praying. Okay? I say thanks to life every day. Thank you for everything, my Father. Thank you for my prayers. Thank you that I can pray also. Thank you. With my deepest gratitude, I love you, Barbara. And it's at the bottom, it says translated from French. Well, I have to say, I have to say that um, thank you to all of you who have written in. I have to say thank you for such a letter that I've just read just now. Um, and I hope that uh, you who are listening at this moment will find some uh, encouragement, some inner stead- steadiness, and uh, uh, hope that our time spent with you is of some benefit to your spiritual growth and understanding and maturity. Uh, all uh, grace to you. Uh, love you, love you, love you. Peace be with you. God is totally already with you. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you for today. God bless you.